What's up, Samuel? What's happening? How you doing, man? Quarantine. Quarantine tanks. I, I miss you, man. I ain't seen my homie in, in weeks, man. Yeah, get in line, player. Get in line. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> like, dang. Dang, maybe we can, nah. maybe we'll keep doing this after everybody comes back. <laughs> uh, nah, but for real, man, excited to have uh, our guest today on the Music Business Podcast. Um, it's been a long time coming. Me and this person have been talking virtually for a few weeks trying to get him on and glad we could finally set it up. Chris Blackwell, the Senior VP of Creative Content at Republic Records. Uh, for those who don't know, he was also a CEO at All Deaf Digital. He went from being head of digital marketing to CEO in four years. Uh, then he transitioned to Republic, where he helps specifically artists. And for those who aren't familiar with Republic, they have Taylor Swift, uh, Drake, and they're you know widely lauded as the the number one label in the world. Um, so he has a really interesting roster to work with. Um, but what he does is he works with creative directors, directors, and artists to help put together original content for the Republic Records artist, uh, artist roster to be a part of. So I, I think that's super interesting and I'm glad we get into it today because, you know, you heard me stutter a little bit earlier. It's, it's, a, it's a field that I'm not super familiar with. Um, and I think a lot of our listeners uh, won't be familiar with. So, you know, me and Sam, you know, we talk about content a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll pass digital. What's the next step? Film yeah. and TV, you know? Um, and that's something that we haven't really, really delved into yet. And I think, you know, this is an important episode for for me as well, in addition to uh, our listeners, because we really get introduced to, you know, a whole new side of of content. What'd you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it, I thought it was amazing. I think obviously there's a as artists and managers and industry professionals, you want to press heavy into the social content side, but there's major kind of uh, content distribution companies, Netflix, Apple plus Disney plus Amazon. There's all these different growing, um, like higher production value, uh, like content networks, if you will. And I think there's a really unique opportunity to create amazing content for those networks. I think, uh, Chris has just a, a, a massive breadth of knowledge from, creating all sorts of different media properties, building audiences online, getting um, tons of traction, whether I think Arts and Raps from All Deaf is a show that I personally love. There's a funny episode with the baby where there's two little kids kind of having a conversation interviewing him. I think uh, obviously the, the game today is, is often won through the content you create and creatively distribute. So I think being able to have Chris on the episode today is, is incredible. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let's let's just jump right into it. Let's do it, Chris. Man, welcome to the Music Business Podcast. Thanks for thanks for virtually coming out, dude. Thanks for virtually having me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making, uh, I know. Also, chain together. Super uh, well, excited. First things first, man. How's how's quarantine treating you? Um, I mean, it's it's cool. I mean, it's not cool, but like, it's just interesting. And being locked up, it's I think it's. it's leading to a lot of like new thought processes and innovation for me in, in particular, it's, um, it's been good just to be forced to narrow down and think about projects, but then like, obviously without the distraction of having to like, cause I go to New York every two weeks for Republic, but like mm-hmm. without to do that, like learning, like I'm, I'm trying to learn Spanish and like working right. on like, design and Photoshop and just like expanding my expertise and taking advantage of this downtime. Right. That's and awesome, I mean, man. you're in LA, right? Yeah. Yeah. I actually live downtown LA. Yep. So you don't have that you don't have that commute time that can take away from other things too, right? Yeah, crazy enough. Like, so I've been in LA for ten years now, and like I've always lived downtown. Downtown's like my my mecca. Um, but like, I never had a car until I, I started at UMG because they're in Santa Monica, and like my first time. Oh wow! Take that commute. So yeah, it's been a, been a fun process. Like now, I, yeah, it's sixty minutes every way. So that's always fun. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. So, well, there you go. It's like so, so much is timed around like, okay, if I leave now at one thirty, I can get home in 45 minutes instead of an hour and a half. And like, Waze is my homie at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, man. That's LA, dude. That's LA. Um, so I guess just for starters, like, how did you find your way into the music industry? Um, yeah. So for me, it's it was kind of, I mean, uh, interesting path. So I'm originally from Maryland, like we were talking about before. I actually got kicked out of college 
after I kicked out of college, I, went, I knew that I always wanted to be in entertainment. And I knew I could either go to New York or LA. And mm-hmm. I knew that if I went to New York, and if shit went bad, I could always just run back home. So I packed up everything I had. I had like $2,000 in my bank account. And then I moved to Los Angeles. Um, when I got here, I started working at the Yard House LA Live, when, when LA Live first opened. Um, and like I started a fashion music and art blog. It was called We With It LA. And the blog was, was covering like up and coming musicians, like artists, and then like fashion labels. So that, that got pretty big. Um, and I mean, at, at their height, I mean, pretty big for me for not knowing what the fuck I was doing. But like at the height, there was like 50 to 75,000 page views a month. And then one of the, the um, brands I was covering is a company called Zame Road. They were based in Australia. They did those like sure shot pants. Um, they're like, oh, we're trying to expand to America and we want you to, to put on like, our marketing. So, I mean, feel free to stop at any time, but uh, it's kind of a long way. I used story. to rock some Zane Robe for the record. Oh, really? yeah. Your yeah. marketing <laughs> told me, bro. Yeah. I mean, was, <laughs> it's come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zane Robe's like for a few summers, it was, it was crazy. And like everyone was wearing them. I mean, we did a collaboration with Kendrick. It was like, it was popping. But then I realized that like it was cool, but like, the partying, all that stuff. I, I feel like I, I, I reached like a ceiling and like I, I wanted to, to go and, and try new things. And so I went on LinkedIn and there's a, um, a job posting at this uh, company called Full Screen, which was, if you know about digital media, it's like what, digital media MCNs. Um, it was for a social media strategist. And so I had no experience in digital or anything like that. So I, <laughs> I, I put together three resumes of people who had that job experience that the, the, the job posting was asking for, and I wouldn't apply it. So I ended up getting like, I mean, at that point, the company only had like 30 people. I ended up getting a uh, interview, and the CEO, George Tripolis, was like, I don't think you really know what you're talking about, because like before, I was like, <laughs> CPM, CPV, all this shit that like, I, I mean, I, I didn't know digital like that. And so he's like, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Come back next week. Come back next week. And so he ended up doing that for like four or five weeks. And then finally, I was like, look, if you're a con man, you're the best con man I know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm going to give you a 90-day contract. And so I did that, uh, ended up getting uh, expanded full-time, ran social media for them. It was, it, was very, it was a very interesting time because during that time, um, this is when digital media was expanding. And like, it was the first time that like, the, the YouTube platform and all this was like really people were seeing as a real disruptor. Um, so I was there for about a year and a half. And then, um, I remember Christmas Eve, like six years ago, Russell called me, Russell Simmons. And he was like, yo, I'm starting all the deaf digital. What would it take for you to come and work for me? And at that point I was like, <laughs> I was in a bad place. I was living with a girlfriend who was like, look, I'm going to Korea to see my family when I get back. I don't want you to be here because we're going through a breakup. <laughs> and so I was like, well, Russell, to be honest, I need, I need a, uh, this is what I want to make for salary, but I need a signing bonus of $10,000 or maybe it was five, just so I can get a security deposit. <laughs> mm. And at first when he called me, um, I, I hung up on him because I thought it was one of my friends fucking with me because I never met Russell. I had no. <laughs> or you're just playing hardball negotiation. Like, oh, Russell Simmons, <laughs> call me back. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Russell Simmons, what would it take you to come work for me? I was like, all right, whatever. I was, some asshole. <laughs> yeah. I was like, they're fucking with me. And so then he called back and then, excuse my language, but he was like, nigga, I'm on a yacht in St. Bart's. So I'm calling your bitch ass. What's it going to take? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, whoa. And so like, I was like, <laughs> and, like for me, it's like, and, and, and I, I never, like, I always wanted to be a music entertainment, but like through like the star of the line perfectly, I finally got that shot. Um, and so I was like, look, I need a sign goes of this much because I had to be out of my apartment in, in a week. Um, and then he's like, he, he's just like, cool, done. And he wired me the money the next day. And so, right. yeah, that was like, and that, that was crazy. And so I, I went on the all deaf digital where, I mean, at that time, I mean, plus when I was at full screen, uh, other medium, the ATT had already bought 50% of the company. And like, for me, like, I mean, I have like hand tattoos. I'm like, the, the, the demographic was like, 13 year old girls from the Midwest and like these, these like these influencers and it just wasn't my vibe. And so like that was the time for, it was for me to move on. So when I went there, it was crazy. Cause I, when I, went, when I was working at full screen, I was like one of six black people there. 
And then I went to all deck and it was like, it was like Wakanda. It was like, <laughs> it was like a bunch of young cats. Like we're, we're doing cool, they were doing cool shit. They just closed this big deal with Samsung, this music discovery platform called AD, ADD52. Um, I was able to work with great people like Amir, who I'm sure you know. Um, and, and so I went to all deaf and started as a director of social and then went to become the head of marketing and I was the head of music and I was a chief digital officer and I became CEO. So within four years, it went from me faking it to make it to like being on the ground floor and like just, I, both of those, both of those jobs are just shit that was monumental to my, to my path. Yeah. Like I'm, That's so, sick, um, man. It's a pretty like significant ascent. What do you feel? Yeah enabled you to really like take those strides in order to go from where you kind of started at all deaf into becoming the CEO? Well, for me, it's like just having that kind of imposter syndrome where I'm like, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong to be here. Like, right. We're smarter than me. Like I didn't graduate from college. Like I I shouldn't be here. That mixed with just a grind. Like, I mean, (laughs) growing up, I was obsessed with that Kid Kelly show, how to make it in America. Yeah. Oh, me too, yo. It's just me too. I, I literally used to watch that TV show every day when I was inspiring myself to, yeah. to come to New York. I was like, I'm going to be like that, yo. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I was just like, I always told myself, like, I might not be the smartest person in the room, but I'm going to make sure that I'm the hardest working. And I mean, I, I, and I still take this, this, this philosophy now. It's like promotions and raises and all that shit don't get, get earned between the hours of nine to five. Like that shit happens before those. And so I was just, the hardest working person there. I um I was luckily lucky to move to LA in a time where I mean the downtown scene was popping and like I really just found a tribe of people and like kind of like the network effect where I mean for the music aspect like Joe Hadley at CA is like my best friend and like, oh, I, owe, like I owe everything to Joe. Like Joe was like I was doing my media thing back when Joe was at Windish. He I mean he first signed Gold Link and like he we were just vibing at the same time and came up together and like that crossover, like he really, that's Joe introduced me to Henny, Joe introduced me to Tunji, Joe introduced me to everybody. And like, we were all young back then. So it was just like, it was a pop in time. And so that mixed with Russell, like believing in me and like me working hard, it just really allowed me to move up quickly. And like, I mean, it was, I, I would say it was 75% luck though. I mean, <laughs> those chances of like, it, it was, yeah, it was a crazy time. Me looking back, I'm just like, it all happened so, so quickly and so fast. And, um, uh, All Deaf was 25% owned by, by Universal Music Group. So that's when I first got, because now, I mean, obviously now I'm at Republic. Um, that's when I first got used to the UMG system and like Jeff Harlson and Lucian like, to, like took an a interest in me just because they saw the shit I was doing over there mm-hmm. um, with with digital series, marketing, events, and all that stuff. So yeah, that, I mean, it was just working hard, finding your right network and just being out in the scene. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you also had to be ready. You know, you said 75% is luck, but you also could have, you know, through any of those positions ended up doing a horrible job and then not going to the next position, you know? Yeah. I mean, you were also ready for those opportunities. Yeah. For me, I mean, now that, I mean, I'm 32 now and back then, I guess I was like 26 or 27. The biggest hurdle that I had was actually myself, like being that young and being that in that environment and like, I mean, just being at times a little cocky, a little bit too arrogant and like just, I really didn't have the the leadership skills of like managing and like under seeing things from other people's perspective. And like, I think all deaf was the thing that took me from, I mean, especially from a professional standpoint, from a boy to a man. And of course there's bumps and bruises along the way, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity, the people that I met and all that shit. Awesome. Awesome. So um, for, for people who don't know, starting at all deaf digital and what you do now, um, what do what does like a, a digital media pa- platform like All Def Digital? How do they work with yeah. Universal Group, Universal Music Group? So Universal Music Group was an investor. So obviously, when the company first started, Russell was there. Um, so Andreessen Horowitz was uh, invested in everyone from Uber, Airbnb, Graycroft, um, Universal Music Group, and WPP, which <clears throat> back then was the world's largest advertisement firm in the world. Um, so. We, I mean, the way that like we, the, the operations of the business was, so at the very beginning, we were an MCN, excuse me, <clears throat> and an MCN basically represents a bunch of digital creators. And so they help them get their CPMs and ad rates. They introduce branded content series, of them, uh, branded content opportunities to them. They 
try to manage their um, <clears throat> their like TV and film stuff, kind of like all the learnings that I, I got from when I was at Full Screen because Full Screen was the biggest one of them all. Mm-hmm. Um, when I went to All Depth, they kind of had a different approach where they were trying to do the same things with comedians. So we had, I mean, very early on, we had people like Spoken Reasons, uh, King Kieran, uh, Kevin Stage, Trevor Wallace, all these people that now are like big, big time comedians. It's like, it was a very, it was a digital playground. And like, there's so much creativity there in the early days. But so, I mean, basically our business model was obviously there's branded, there's branded content and advertisements. So we had a platform, All Deaf, which I mean, when I started, we had about 200,000 subscribers and then mine moved on at 15 million. So building that digital audience where you can go direct to consumer as opposed to having to, to go with other partners. So that was a big, um, a big revenue stream, like the branding content, the AdSense, all that shit that comes with full videos. But then the other aspect of our business was premium content where, I mean, when I was there, we did all deaf uh, coming live on HBO for two seasons. We actually did the uh, the movie, the after part of a Kyle, but then when the Russell stuff happened, we actually sold our, our position to Live Nation um, and all that. We did traffic jams on Spotify for two years. So <clears throat> at the beginning, those were the two business models. But towards the end, as the, as the digital media landscape was changing so quickly, like, I mean, there was like a purge in about 2017, 2018, where like companies were wildly evaluated like i mean vice at one point was valued at one billion dollars now i think they're at around 250 and so brands started introducing more and more diverse revenue streams so towards the end of my tenure at all deaf we were doing more experiential like we had this series called all deaf la which was <clears throat> a, a roaming party we had our um let's see all deaf la we had our like live streaming c- components and stuff like that so to make more directors consumer revenue streams Awesome. So, so after that, what, how does, how did that role switch into what you do now at Republic? Um, so yeah, so after five years of being at all deaf towards the end, um, unfortunately, like the funding just wasn't there. And after Russell's departure, because of the, <clears throat> the allegations, it was kind of put on me to become the leader of the company because I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the board wanted to like shut the company down, but they gave me a shot. Like, Look, we'll give you a year to turn around the company. And if you do, then you can become CEO. So in that year, I closed a $5 million original content deal at Universal Music Group where we were doing short-form content, long-form content, experiential and promotions. Um, I then got struck by CAA to, to start working on things in the, in the, um, in the marketplace. Um, and then, I mean, towards the end, like, we just kind of hit that, that, uh, that wall where the funding and the revenue just weren't meeting. And at that point, the company was like four years, I've been around for four years and it was just time for me to move on. Um, but I mean, and, and I, I, we ended up selling the company to TI and so it had a, a pleasant landing. Mm-hmm. So thankfully all depth is still around. I mean, <clears throat> Teddy Ray, Patrick Cloud, all those guys are still over there. So, but for me, I mean, I, at that point I went from a director of social to a CEO. So, I mean, I kind of learned the, the hard way about corporate financing and all the players in the marketplace. And so <clears throat> when I had that, that, that output deal with the universal music group, one of the big things that I had to do was every month go to all the, the CEOs of the, of the labels are underneath the universal music group. So Janik at Periscope, Monty at Republic, uh, Rosen, uh, Paul, when he was still at Def Jam, Mm-hmm. And so once all depth left, I was kind of like a free agent. And so I was thinking about going to title. I was thinking about going to revolt. Um, but then Lucian, Jeff and Monty were like, Oh, why don't you come to the um, Republic and take all the, the innovativeness and disruption and all the stuff that you're trying to do at uh, all depth and bring it to a bigger platform here at universal. So <clears throat> now at universal, what I do is I'm the SVP of creative content development. And so in a nutshell, it's essentially finding, using our roster, not even our roster, but trying to develop original content and long form content, premium content. So we can kind of diversify what we're doing and not just be a music recording company, but uh, right. Yeah. So like selling projects to Netflix and all that stuff. And, yeah. Can you, uh, that's incredible. First of all, and I definitely somebody that lives and breathes lots of content myself, see the need for labels to invest in their own original content. I think it's the, it's becoming table stakes for artists to thrive. And I think as the landscape is shifting, it's a you see different entities like colors that are building so much leverage uh, yeah. by building distributions through creating their own original content series that ultimately like the they're the 
Whereas traditionally labels used to own distribution into stores and press. Like today, yeah. you want to build up your owned media channels so you can reach an audience directly. Can yeah, you directly speak? Yeah. yeah. Can you speak to? I mean, uh, let's unpack that and peel that back because there's a. It's, to me, it's fascinating the fact that that's your role at that company is the like that role should be prevalent at every single label. But I'm not sure that all labels are playing their cards that way. What are the specific types of content that you're you're pressing into? Like specific series or? Yeah. Yes, I mean, so I mean, just what you're saying is like what gave me an opportunity, and like it's it's less digital. I mean, digital stuff is. I mean, I, we have a great team, Eli, Tim over at, at the public that kind of focus on that to make to make sure that artists have a DTC presence. Right. Um, I can speak a little bit to that, but then I'll, I'll speak to what I'm doing. Um, mm-hmm. So with that stuff, I'm a big fan, big believer. Of obviously, running a media company that have 15 million subscribers, 300 million monthly views, I think there's a huge opportunity with the label systems just to own that experience, especially on YouTube. I feel like uh, artists' YouTube channels just shouldn't be music videos. That's a missed opportunity because what you need to have is have that daily touch point with your audience because especially for emerging artists, it's like, like I mean, I think like Guap Dev 4000 does a great job. With Incredible. Yeah, Guap, Sam, that's, that's, those are my homies. Like, that's the stuff type of shit that you need to be doing just so you, you start building your super fans. And it's not just whenever I drop a music video, I'm dropping a music video to a channel that is not in the algorithm of YouTube. It's not, there's not activity there. So really helping those guys develop that stuff. So like, what's the type of low thrash, low hanging fruit that we can put out on the platform? And I mean, obviously other media companies like myself back in when I was all deaf, genius, vice complex, all that, they serve their purpose too, because they do have a huge audience that's great for discovery. But instead of giving these opportunities and these content series and this stuff to other platforms, I think there's a great, opportunity to build series that can be interchangeable and 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 really help grow the channel itself but then get and, and grow their their super fans so mm-hmm. i mean that like i said that's that's more of what, what eli and tim does i mean we, we've been doing a lot of stuff with tiktok with flight house um stuff like that but for my role is what i'm doing is so i mean typically hollywood and music it's two different crowds so mm-hmm. usually when you go to, to a Hollywood, Netflix, and when I say Hollywood, Netflix, Viacom, um, uh, Apple Plus, those players, when someone from a label comes involved, they, the number one thing they, they, the only thing they usually care about is like, yo, can I get cheaper music clearances? Can I get cheaper licensing? All that mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Just because it's just two different crowds. And so my role is to kind of be, I mean, I, I have creative content in my title, but I'm not really a creative. My, my job is to find the, the best directors the up and coming people and, and give them a chance to, to be with these Hollywood crowds. So, and you have the Hollywood, the Hollywood companies, Viacom, Netflix, blah, blah, blah. You have the production companies, which are like production companies like Mad or 51 Minds, all these people who normally produce this content. Um, and then you have the artists. So between those three roles, I mean, and, and the creative directors and all that stuff. So between those four people, my job is, cause I mean, I have monthly like meetings with HBO Max, Quibi, stars, all this stuff. Find the mandates of content that work. Like, okay, we're buying content that resonates with the audience 18 to 24, um, docu comedies, whatever, whatever it is. So I take that information, go through our artist roster and see which, which, which artists are like really meant or ready for that type of stuff. Um, because like a lot of times with artists, it's like a, uh, two, a two hour verified genius shoot and then doing a show, it's totally different. Like mm. you're doing premium TV show, those shoots need 10 to 12 hours and just not every artist is ready for that type of commitment. So I, I find the right artists that, that are ready for that and like have some, some likes that might be able to, to be paired with what the, the, the networks are buying. Mm-hmm. And then the last one is finding like a proper production company that can come in and, and help facilitate that because a lot of times with production companies and studios and all that, that stuff, not every production company and studio is right for every project. Um, right. It's like, it just, some people are better suited with other things and some people arm so once i have this the network the artist the production company most times let's say if there's a, a creative director or something like that i'll, I'll reverse engineer and be like Yo, look like people pitch me all the time i have a great idea how can i get to the next level so i'll take the the emerging director's content find the right artist and then attach a production company and then go to the network so it's always some combination of those four things sometimes it's just a production company pitches me and just us, us going to the network, but then sometimes I really like to empower the next generation of thought leaders, mm-hmm. um, especially in in the um, the urban. I hate using the term, but like mm-hmm. just right. 
find the people who make the content because, I mean, I think at least at Republic Monty is really good at, we see creatives in front of the camera and behind it. And so I, I really want to be, because I mean, forever there's been so many gatekeepers and you see the same same voices. Like, and I think that in this space, there's opportunities to, get, to put more people on and to be, creating, to be creating some unique creative content. That's amazing. Super exciting. Damn, bro. Yeah, that was I so so you so this is a this is sort of a role that I'm sort of exploring for the first time with you right now because <laughs> I, I you know I wasn't necessarily sure that this was a role at a big label. So I guess I guess one of my first questions is, um, you know, if you're an independent artist or if you're an artist on Republic, what are the signs that you look for to to see if that artist is ready for that next step? Well, I mean, for me, I just like obviously like if they have a compelling story. I mean, let's say they. Love- of cooking, or they just have a lot of energy, like Corey LeRae on, on their roster. That girl, if there's a camera, if there's not, is just always going to be the center point of the room. So there's mm. some where there's shows where, where the networks are just like casting for people. And it's like, hey, we, we have this type of show, this is the type of energy, who can we put in it? But then if it's someone like Koi, the opportunity that I would do is, because at All Deaf, we kind of did these arable pilots where we started things on digitally, on digital whether it be arts and raps, plan B, um, stuff like that. And then once we had, had the built-in fan base, had the built-in audience, we'd take it out and pitch it to platforms. So for mm-hmm. the more emerging artists, it's like, look, let's start something, like kind of connect to what I said in the beginning of the conversation. Let's start something on your channel, whether it be a vlog, whether it be a cooking series, and then take it out to the network, take it out to the networks, because at that point, you have all the data, you have all the watch time, you have all that. And so a lot of times when you're pitching networks, it's less of a question of who it is, but like you just have to, to match demographics because they know who they're, who they're buying for. If you can mm-hmm. go to the, like, look, this was a digital series. The demographic is 60%, 18 to 24 females, blah, blah, blah. You eliminate them being able to say no because look, it's not the guessing game. You have all that, that those metrics for you right there. I mean, one, one thing that <clears throat> we're doing now is like uh, during my time at Def, I worked with Rich the Kid and we, we did a series that he was really into and we kind of uh, flipped it, changed it. It's kind of, it's a totally different series, but like just seeing his passion for digital and seeing how he, how he reacts on those stages allowed us to build something bigger and different for him for what we're taking on now. Awesome. Awesome. When you, you mentioned so, when it comes to, when it comes to like networks, you mentioned uh, Quibi. I know this is kind of timely given that they just recently launched. Like, can you talk about your thoughts on Quibi? Do you feel like Quibi's here to stay? Um, well, it, yeah, I mean, with Quibi, it came out at an interesting time. I mean, obviously, with Jeffrey Katzenberg and Matt Whitman, they're, they're bound to, to be successful, uh, at least from an organization standpoint. But um, Quibi's for context like, for the listeners, Quibi is essentially highly produced, like mid short form content. So think like five to 10 minute long content series, but produced like a TV show. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's an interesting thing. So, I mean, it's really meant for for metropods and people who are always on the go. That's why it's mobile first, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you mentioned the, sh- the shortened time frame. That's interesting just because not everyone's really, really in the position to have that lean back experience where they have 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the, I mean, they're spending crazy money. Like yeah. they're spending $100,000 per minute for content. So right. for a show that's five minutes, they'll, they'll spend half a million dollars, which is fucking crazy. <laughs> that's um, that's the, and I mean, I think that the strongest thing over there is the organization they have. I mean, they have Naomi, who used to be at Mass Appeal, who like kind of runs her music stuff. They have this this woman, Jahan Robbins, Robinson, who uh, came from Netflix, who did like Rapture and all that. And a lot of times when these new platforms launch, they fail because they don't have strong organization. Like if you look at like Go90 a couple of years ago from Verizon, like Verizon's just called like, look, we'll just throw shit at the board and we're Verizon. Here's $2 billion going around and it didn't, and it didn't really work. But I think Quibi, unfortunately they launched at a time where, I mean, they launched their launch date was a week into the pandemic pandemic. So it's just like, they, that's, that sucks. But also that could be an opportunity because people are at home and um, throughout this whole Corona thing, the thing that you're seeing is consumption patterns are changing so much that, I mean, video is up 80%. Um, and yeah, so I mean, people are, are consuming more content than ever, but, um, yeah. Do you think you feel like they stand a really good chance of becoming like a, uh, a primary destination for content consumption going forward? I think it's super too early to tell. I mean, obviously all the players in the landscape you have, 
YouTube, which used to be YouTube Red, that was behind the paywall. Now they put it in front of the paywall. That I mean, it's 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 around. It's doing great. I mean, you have Apple Plus that's just launched. You have Disney Plus. You have Netflix. You have Hulu. You have all these people, and like mm-hmm. for most of these platforms, survive is like what makes you excuse me. What makes you different? And I mean, it's just way far too early to tell with I mean, they have the star power, and the thing that when you're behind the paywall, that's kind of why the reason why they wanted to go after all these stars is just because it cuts your marketing costs down. If you say, hey, I have a, a series of Chance the Rapper uh, punked, you're going there to see Chance the Rapper, so you don't have to spend, you, you still market it, but not the level of marketing you'd have to do without a, a brand new show without Chance the Rapper. Right. So I think that right now they'll have a lot of big artists at the front, and as their user, their, their user base grows, and that might shift a little bit. But I mean, it's an interesting strategy. And I, and I think with the team they have over there, I mean, if, I don't see why he couldn't succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Be exciting to see. Time will tell. Yeah. What, um, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. No, I was just going to think about like, uh, I mean, it's, it's just interesting too, that, that the time now it's, I mean, it, it seems like I love your strategy, how you're going to, major networks and distribution that will enable a level of production and distribution that is oftentimes leaps and bounds bigger than what any artist can do just on their own socials. But it's also fun to be at a, at a time where artists can create their own shows and distribute via socials. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a fun, delicate balance, I'm sure. And I mean, don't yeah. get I mean, a lot of times people come to me because obviously we're at, we're, I'm at Republic. I have, we have Ariana, we have Drake, we have The Weeknd, we have Taylor, we have all those people. And like, mm-hmm. What I tell people for them, it's like, bro, if you're coming to me for a show idea for them, let's just take Drake. Drake in the past year has done Euphoria, Top Boy, all this. If Drake wants to do something, Drake is going to do something. And so, I mean, even though I do, like, there is opportunity for those people, but it's more like doing, like, when you're a producer and you're going to the studio and just, you're just playing beats for someone to see which ones pops. So, like, mm-hmm. taking them like, three or four ideas and seeing which ones resonates is, is an approach, but... For me, I really see value in building something for like the, I mean, I don't like to tier any artist, but like that emerging cl- class because the value prop that I say to uh, networks is like, look, like these guys are here now. By the time this show gets in production, aired, all that shit, it's going to be eight to 12 months. So you can really take a gamble on like, oh, I, I, I like for instance, our artist Conan Gray, he's going to be up for, for best new artist of the year. Now is the time to lock in something with him, get a camera on him and start following him because that's going to be the stuff like, I mean, when it comes to great music content, the thing that makes a doc great or just okay is just the level of access. You have to give people shit behind the camera that they haven't seen anywhere else. Like, and for me, like recently that little peep documentary came out and like, I've, I've talked about this a million times already, but like that, that for me was like one of the best music docs I've seen because even though if you're if you're if you were aware of a little peep before, there that level of access and what you knew and what you I mean what you found out post watching that doc it, it makes you a fan just because you that story hasn't been out there that often. So for me, it's really finding those stories to tell and really and diving into them. Yeah, for sure, that's super exciting. What sort of uh, background work do you have to do to get to know these artists to know what type of projects that they're into, I mean, or that for- they would be into? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, I, I, there's always, like, two levels. Either they're unscripted or scripted. Like, I mean, just because, like, there's people, like, right now I'm working with a Amine on something. Or there's a bunch of different stuff that people like to do and don't want to do. But usually at the label system, I mean, for me, that was a little bit of a learning curve because mm-hmm. earlier I've always worked at startups and, like, going to, like, a corporation, like Universal Music Group, and then going inside a label, like, like for public inside of UMG, it's like going from – <laughs> a double A college team going to the New, New England Patriots it's just because mm-hmm. that level of success and all of that. And like, there's people there who's, I mean, it's just the best of the best. And so finding the right ways to do it and, and not just coming there and assuming, Oh shit, just cause I did this in the past. I mean, I, I have the right to, to get in front of these people. So the mm-hmm. tactic that I, I usually take is just, I mean, inside of any label, there's like a Mar lead and an NR lead talking to them, getting, getting on their good, Good, yeah, good side and like just letting them know what I'm trying to do um, and really just making sure the whole team is involved instead of just trying to go rogue and like going directly to the artist or, or, or the artist manager because I mean that can help you in the very beginning but if it's not a team thing it's going to hurt you in the end so I'll go to the marketing and our lead get introduced to the mayor once the man once I talk to the manager see what, what he wants to do for his artist um, then I go then we all sit down with the artist and like for me 
I never like to say, hey, this is what I want you to do because artists have people in their life all the time like saying, mm. this is what I want you to do. Um, and an idea that someone else wants you to do 12 hours into a shoot, you're going to just be like, fucking, I'm over it. So I like to really just sit down <laughs> and have like a candid conversation with them. It was like, yo, what's the stuff that you want to do? Like, like I know like Ski Mask loves gaming. So like now I'm talking like to Face Clan and trying to get shit going with them. And like, once you, once you, they give you that insight of like what they like, it makes it a lot easier because it eliminates all the bullshit and the noise of like bringing them ideas that they don't like. Because the worst thing you can do is, is take something to an artist that they don't like and then they're like, oh, fuck it, this guy's whack. His ideas are whack. And then you're in kind of needs to <laughs> like, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. I don't want to be, I don't want to be an enemy to, to, to any artist or manager. And I want to make sure that I'm, bring, I'm not wasting their time and vice versa, I'm not wasting my time. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, so it seems like you obviously have a lot of firepower with Republic in terms of just them, you know, and the access that they have to different networks, that sort of thing. Um, how can independent managers and independent artists kind of get in this world uh, without that infrastructure? Or how do you think they should start thinking about it? I mean, like I said, I'll, I'll go back to Sam Lancaster and Guap Dad. Like Sam, like they, those vlog series, like Guap Dad has had such good marketing and pull out. Like he's in, Dependent, he's doing this thing. It's just like doing. Always have a cameraman around. You always have. Mm-hmm. Always start capturing that shit because I mean, back when like let's see, so like when Dreamville sold that doc to HBO, I think like three or four years ago when they went on tour, or J Cole when they went on tour, um, when he went on tour, all that shit was just filmed by a homie man, a homie videographer, and then they had all <laughs> that, and then they just sold it to him because J Cole became J Cole, and so like if you just have a homie with a camera. Even with a little peep documentary, that was all like things that they were just recording. Like, don't don't wait on the network to come to you and say, "Hey, we have this show idea for you." Start practically doing that yourself, and like, and, and start exploring what the creative vision, what the creative side of ours is is going to be. Mm-hmm. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to think about. Um, I mean, a lot of artists, it's trying to strike the balance of cost too. So, yeah. yeah. It's it's a big it's a it's such a great investment though, and I, I think oftentimes artists wait until a little too late in their career to really make the investment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, getting the music right is for should be the first step. Like, right. no one like really care if you have a vlog if if you haven't really put the time into to perfect your sound. But um, right. yeah, I mean, that, and that's I mean, that's kind of like the basis of the the why going with a label helps out because. There's ancillary resources you have access to and people and all that stuff and right. who will invest. In. I mean, it, it is an investment. I mean, but yeah. For sure. Um, how do you think these uh, media partnerships between artists and networks and, you know, et cetera, will grow in the future? And and if anything, do you think that the pandemic has kind of shed light on uh, what that could look like or has it has it not really changed that much? Um, I mean, I think that right now during this pandem- pandemic, I always say pandemic, I forgot that, forget the end. Um, <laughs> but when, with so many creative people being forced to sit down, like I feel like whenever we come out of this, it's going to be so much innovation in the creative space. Mm-hmm. I mean, you already see it like what, what Glass Animals is doing now on this, on their Instagram with uh, quarantine covers where um, he was starting to cover from Nirvana to Lana Del Rey to, okay, now he's, Filming it, putting it on his YouTube channel. Those YouTube videos are getting half a million views. Now they're, he's, we're releasing those original songs. So, like, there's tons of innovation that's happening. And, like, I don't think it's going to lead. I mean, and then even for me, like, right now, before I went to this quarantine, I had probably, like, six or seven projects I was developing. But now, I mean, I'm coming out of it with, like, with, with 13. So, like, I'm working on mm-hmm. everything from, like, the Pop Smoke documentary to um, I'm working on a project with Bue and Murray. It's kind of – it's kind of covering like quarantine covers so like the smart people are going to take this time to like really get ahead on development and writing creating and just getting ahead some people are just packing up and going home but like it's just because because what's happening in the original content space is um all these networks are pulling for their content so if you look at like espn with the michael jordan doc that wasn't supposed to come out until like i think august but at the same time when they're pulling for their content they're stopping the production on a lot of things Mm-hmm. so there's going to be a content gap coming out of this where we were not filming anything new and we pulled for our, our bank content so they're going to need hours of programming and so for me my whole approach is by the time we get out of this we're going to have so many pitches to like so many, so many developed scripted scripts written all that shit where 
and we're going to come out on top just because we're casting as many fat, fat uh, fishing rods as possible and hoping that one hits. Yeah, right. Sick. For emerging artists, does it make sense to reach out to networks on their own, or is this it's it's a they no, just need I mean, to focus I, on their own stuff for now? I mean, there's no problem. Don't don't. I would never recommend reaching out to a network and asking them to create the show for you. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, always put in the time and, and you have to defend yourself. And so even now when I work with artists on all scales, I'm not, I always mm-hmm. like, I mean, I'm developing a project right now with <laughs> Jay Sean, the artist who did that song down yeah. back in the day, where it's, yeah. it's actually a great project. And it's about him re-entering the marketplace as a four-year-old uh, um, one hit wonder, as people would say. I did air quotes, so just in yeah, case yeah. <laughs> um, but like, and that was something that I first started working on that in December. And I was like, look, before we bring other people around, let's make sure that we have your idea on the paper. Because once you start going out to these networks and once you start going out to these buyers, they're going to start picking that apart. And they're going to try to put their own perspective on it. And if you don't right. have your own idea patent down, then it's the worst case scenario. Then, then you put something out in the marketplace that you and, and the network aren't happy about because you guys weren't aligned on the creative and like the artists most most times is the people who get their ideas or their product diminished were just because they didn't do the proper work in the beginning to defend their ideas and have it iron tight right for sure it's a lot of sense right. what are the deal point i mean and obviously you can't like bring out a contract and talk through it right now but when you when you're talking with these these networks i mean what are the like the common I mean, you're, you're paying attention to like distribution potential. Like, yeah. a, a, you have a cool concept. You're you're speaking with Netflix, Apple Plus. I mean, it, does it really just boil down off into just like distribution potential and 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 budget? Well, if you if you have a, a concept, obviously before you, I mean, well, not obvious because uh, I'm still well, I'm not still learning, but yeah. Anyway, so when yeah. you go there, you have, to, uh, you have to, well, I am still learning. Every day is a learning lesson. Yeah, yeah. you have to have, especially for these like big like. Big productions, you have to have a production company attached to it because there's like liability insurance, there's all that stuff. Um, so mm-hmm. most times, if you have an idea, you can go to a production company and do like a co development deal where you're like, hey, I have this idea, I will share the IP with you to develop it out, and we can take it out together. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, on the opposite end, like let's say a production company has an idea and they just want to attach you, then there's like a, an EP talent attachment agreement. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to like ownership and all that shit, like it doesn't really matter because like Netflix, like most chances when you go there, they, when they buy it, they, they spend more money just to own it. So it's yeah. like, yeah. And then what, what constitutes a great pitch? Cause to be super candid, this is, uh, I'm going back to a memory I have where one of the biggest artists that I, I've worked with for a long time, we were pitching a, uh, series to YouTube originals, yeah. but candidly, I'm in the game of like social content, which is like we already alluded to a, a bit night and day from this world of like highly produced production content. And I know YouTube originals is in this white space of, yes, they're a social platform, but they're trying to go into this like highly produced Netflix realm of content, if you will. So I, I think we could, they, we were happy with the pitch deck we had, but <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you would have been able to be like, bro, you need to do this, 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 and this. Yeah, I mean, and none of which is there. What constitutes a great pitch to you? What does it have to include? Yeah. Me, when I go into a pitch, it's it's obviously, I mean, just having the right people who can be confident in that room because when you're with your homies, when you're in a controlled environment, it's cool. But the minute you go into a long conference table and there's five execs who don't really get your idea and they, they you don't know, have they had eight pitches before? What mood are they in? Are they just trying to get through this fucking meeting just yeah. so they can go to their next <laughs> It's yeah. like, that shit can be super fucking intimidating and like right. and you, you kind of have to win the room and sometimes like let's say you're doing an unscripted project sometimes the director of the project isn't really the best person to sell it in the room so for a great pitch knowing who's the pitcher rehearsing like the speaking okay when we go through this pitch so and so is going to intro it then we're going to do this then we're going to play the sizzle blah 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 um just rehearsing that beforehand just so when you're not in the room is like it's like everyone's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> um, and so like that's that's just like the pre, the pre prep. But like for an actual pitch, I like to go in with a obviously a pitch deck. If there's a sizzle, that's great, um, and that's for unscripted. When it comes to scripted projects, like most buyers like to know that there's as much attachments as possible. So like if you say like, oh, this would be perfect for so and so, like don't that's no one ever is gonna buy a, a project and like, oh, well, I think they would like it. Like make sure you have all your attachments, right. all your people before. Um, mm-hmm. 
and yeah, and just know just know the room. Like, I mean, if you know, like for instance, like HBO Max, the woman who runs Alternative, there's Jen Connell. Like, if you know that HBO Max's demographic is female based content, eighteen to 20, uh, 24 to thirty two. Let's just say that. Like, right. don't make them a ski mask project that is for. 13 to 17 or whoever, like, just know the room you're, you're, you're mm-hmm. going into your research. Sure. Um, a lot of times, like for me, like when, with all the buyers, it's kind of like a, you have to smooch them a little bit. Like, so whether it's always having like, uh, like check-in lunches, concert yeah. tickets, it's like, you have, that's just the name of the game. And right, like, right, right, right. Like warming up to them and, and building a relationship with the people you're pitching. And like, you can't just go into someone's, you can't just talk to these buyers only when you want to sell them something because then, they know what it is. You have to build some type of rapport. So like, I know I kind of got off tangent, but no, no, the perfect pitch yeah. is knowing your audience, having the proper material and just delivering it in the proper way. Yeah, for sure, man. What, um, what are your favorite shows and why shows you've touched, produced, developed, or just other things that you're seeing in the market that you love, whether it's, it's um, produced stuff or just, uh, you've already alluded to some of the stuff. Guap yeah. dad, the yeah, so, I mean, Falcon, I some of the shit that I did at All Def, obviously, like, Arts and Raps, Sydney, Cam, Amir, all the guys I worked with over there on that, like, that was just a great show because of the simple concept that we started and it kind of blew up to be this big franchise, which everyone, from a music standpoint, when they think of All Def music, they think about um, Arts and Raps. That was a great project. I loved that just because, I mean, two kids interviewing a rapper, people yeah. can be hard as fuck as they want to be, but when you're in front of kids, you can't be that hard. So like yeah. that, um, and then from a uh, from a premium standpoint, like we, I did the project on um, traffic jams. I was on Spotify. I mean, that was cool. That because I went from like an email saying like, oh, we should do something like this, to I mean, Sid in the mirror once again stepped on and like really helped bring everyone home. And like that was like the first premium show we did all deaf, and so that was special. Traffic jam for those of you who don't know, there's a rapper and there's a producer in the car. And we picked them up from the airport. And by the time they get to a venue, they had to write, record, and perform an original song in front of a live audience. So that was like one of Spotify videos' first show. Um, and like it, it did really well. So that was, that was some great stuff. I was all deaf. In terms of like general content out there, I mean, for scripted, I mean, I love Ozark. Ozark is really good. Like, I love the story there. Mm-hmm. I just started watching the show on Amazon called Zero Zero Zero. Yeah. Um, which is a great show. And then in terms of unscripted docs, my favorite unscripted doc of all time is The Radiant Child by, by Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, I'm a huge like fan of that era. As mm-hmm. you can tell, it's Keith Haring wall behind me. Yeah. Um, and then... Specifically this- about that about that documentary. Um, I just like that because it's just, like, like I always said, like the access and, and going behind where people can read the headlines. Like if there's docs out there that you just show the surface level stuff, that's mm-hmm. no one, that's not compelling. No one's gonna be in a conversation like, "Yo, I watched this doc. You have to watch it." Like it's just, it, it, it was compelling, and so like, and plus, I mean, even though I wasn't around during that era, I think that the '90s New York was the mecca of creativity. I mean, from the, what was going on, on the Lower East Side with Basquiat, all those guys, to music, to to everything. '90s was just where it was at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and more recently, in terms of unscripted docs, like uh, like I said, that little peep doc really stuck with me just because. Um, it was just a tragic tale of not having the right people around you and how an artist who can who can be so great like can be put out so soon. Mm-hmm. And while I was at All Def, I did this. We had this, this podcast called uh, Ham Radio with this party collective called Ham Everything. And little mm-hmm. people on there, and like it's just crazy that that was one of those things where obviously when we're in the industry, we have so many people that come into our lives and we touch them, and like either we're busy, we're we're doing a million things where we don't sit down and actually listen to the lyrics, listen to what they're saying and like, and listen to that. And like, that was just like a cautionary tale of like giving the youth more credit and just being there for them when they need us. Right. Yeah. Love it. Yep. Um, so we're kind of seeing, you know, there's obviously more content now than ever um, just with the advent of things like Netflix, YouTube, obviously just all these cons- consumption platforms um, and your role and the role that some of your people, some of your uh, partners have in just making music content specifically, as opposed to film and TV. I assume that it's gotten a lot bigger um, in the past decade or so. Um, do you see, do you see your role and the role of that of your partners do you, do you see it becoming, um, you know, 
where campaigns are are media first instead of music? Do you ever see it getting that big? Or um, I guess, how do you see within a label structure um, your role shifting? Because I, d- I do think it'll change yeah. you know, over time. Yeah, so when I first came to Republic, like I told Monty, like, look, well, two things I don't want. I don't want a big team. And I don't want a big budget. Because mm-hmm. when you have big, big budgets, there's big expectations. And mm-hmm. coming in there, if you don't know the landscape of the, of the business, the, the organism that is Republic, you don't know how the outside world is going to take it. Um, I was like, so for me, it's kind of like, even though I'm at the, the world's biggest record label, I'm still kind of in the startup mode because I, I'm hunting for my food. Me selling projects means that I can grow the team. I can do things in a smart way because mm-hmm. right now, I mean, I, I, I do have a small team, but like, I like it that way. It's just because I don't want the, the inflated overhead, having to worry about P and now having to worry about all that shit and like being small keeps me nimble. But then obviously like, I'm sure that if, I mean, the record label industry, as soon as, it's like keeping up with the Joneses. As soon as someone else does something that's successful, then someone else will do it. And so I'm sure, obviously, with the more success that there is around the original content space, the more um, these labels will be beefing up. But I just, I think that a lot of times going after traditional Hollywood executives won't work because Hollywood executives are used to being a Hollywood executive at a big studio with a big team and a big budget. And so coming to a label system, it probably won't work for them, but then also it's like a cultural thing. Like for me, the reason why I can talk to these art, the arts communities, the production communities, all this, because these are like my people. I'm fucking 32. I know these people. I know these managers. I'm not some old out of touch person who comes to them. And it's like, so my grandson was watching TikTok and heard your song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how much, how much that happens. I'm like, bro, the minute you do that, you, you give yourself up. Like they're yeah, like, okay, this is <laughs> who doesn't understand. And like with me, like whether it be with the artist community, the creative director community, all that shit, like my, my vision is just to give the people on the come up, someone who's going to fight for them in these fucking rooms and who has power to be like, no, I'm working with this person. And that, that's just what it is. Right. So I, I, obviously the more success that happens, the bigger will happen. Like for instance, like, I mean, with Interscope doing the Billie Eilish documentary for $25 million, people just see $25 million and think, oh fuck! I need to, I need to staff up. I need to. Do <laughs> but what they don't understand is, a, Airscope invested two million dollars of that three years ago, and that was a big gamble. And so they just signed to to invest that type of money. And when the project sells, it's like, yeah, because they 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 inherited the risk. And if you're willing to put money before and like invest, then yes, you can make. I mean, that that Billy Eilish shop was the twelve and a half uh, x return. Yeah. But, like it, that, that's because they invested in it, and a lot of times too with the artist community as well is when they see a doc sells for twenty five million dollars, that whole twenty five million dollars doesn't go to the artist. Like it's not like, <laughs> wait, I was, but you'd be surprised at how many artists like when when that shit happens, it sets they the think bar. It's, you know? yeah, 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 that yeah. artist is like, I want twenty five million dollars for a doc. It's like you're like, bro. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't look so like that. Yeah, that, that's how for three years of production. Like, there's like a shopping agent that gets a fee. There's like that's not go okay. Like twenty five million dollars in the Billy's pocket. Like, yeah. And yeah. So like, that's that's another thing that I'm very happy about too. Is like just the education process of being inside a label and, and like how the outside world works and how Hollywood works. Because right. a lot of times, like, because most music industry has that mindset, they go into these rooms and they're like, well, this, this person just doesn't know what they're talking about. I can't even have a conversation with them. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of like the, the, the in-between to kind of like uh, talk to both sides. Right. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Chris, man, thanks for coming out, dude. This has been great. Yeah. yeah uh, no, this is definitely super- a word that, you know, I'm looking forward to introducing our, our podcast listeners to for sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll catch you catch you on Netflix, bro. When's when's your special? <laughs> what's the behind the scenes of Chris Blackwell, Blackwell's life coming out, bro? <laughs> yeah, where's your camera? Man? <laughs> always it to me like Chris Blackwell. Which one? Because Chris Blackwell obviously found Island Records. Mm. <laughs> oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, a lot of times I'll be on the emails of people who are like, "Oh my god, thank you so much." <laughs> right. Growing up, like I was always inspired by Bob Marley, Bob Marley and all that. I'm like, bro. Yeah. Wrong one. It's so embarrassing. There's been times where I just don't get emails back from people because they're so fucking embarrassed. But that's hilarious. <laughs> Amazing. I love what you guys are doing, and like I know, like more podcasts like this, and hopefully, like this can inspire someone else. And like what you guys are doing, right? 
is needed. And like, I know that this will, will grow and be something that's like kind of like the Bible for the hip hop industry. I'm just happy to be a part of it in the beginning. Well, thank you so thank much, you, man. man. Well, thank you. Until next time, brother. Man, well, that was a fun episode. I think uh, Chris, super smart dude. I think really great to see and have his take on just kind of the evolution of the market towards content, towards what makes a great show, how to get a pitch bought in. Um, the the fact that it's never really too early to start documenting. I think there's just a, a lot of very tactical gems there uh, in addition to just some great insight as far as the direction of the music industry and, and how that's dovetailing and connecting with, with content, major content productions. Yeah, I also thought it was important that we went over his uh, rise from from where he started at All Dev Digital, being a uh, digital marketer to, to CEO and um, kind of what brought him there. Um, one thing that I like to go over on the podcast a fair amount is not just, you know, these are the tips and, and insights and tactics for this specific field, but this is also how this person got to where they are. Um, you know, the industry can be, there's, everybody has a different a different uh, way of getting to the point where they are through in different timelines. And, you know, his was an impressive one in four years. So um, I'm glad we got to go over that as well and just, and just his journey. Yeah. Well, uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you're staying safe during these these quarantine times, unprecedented market conditions. Push forward, adapt, innovate. We're all in this together. We love y'all. See you next week. See you guys.